so thankful for anointed worship team. Absolutely. The key components. Aren't you thankful for our anointed team? A couple of people are. <laughs> I know I am. You know, there's something about music that breaks off things. If you look through the Bible, even the King Saul, when he was tormented uh, by demonic influences, it said, bring in the minstrel, bring in someone, not just a talented person, but someone who knows how to worship. And David, they brought David in, and David would begin to worship and play. He was skilled at his instrument. And when he would play, it would bring peace into the situation. It would drive the demons out. Because you know what David was doing? He was worshiping the Lord. Saul just happened to be sitting in on what David was doing on the regular, in the fields, in the pasture. And so you don't, you don't have to wait till Sunday to have church. You're supposed to have church every day. You can have church at home uh, with your spouse. You can have church by yourself. I have church by myself a lot of times. I have church in my truck. I'm driving down the street and start crying, start praying, start thanking. See, the cool thing about God is he said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. He's with you everywhere you go. In the good, in the bad, in the happy, in the sad. He's with you. So cool. I love God. Don't you just love him? He, he's amazing. I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't want to come through here and just have a regular service. Does anybody else just want to do regular? We're regular is boring. We're not regular. Remember, we're not ordinary. That's what we learned last week. We're not ordinary. You know what ordinary is? Getting sick, laid up in the hospital. Living paycheck to paycheck, waiting for your government cheese or your check. I'm just saying, that's normal. You know what else is normal? Bankruptcy, divorce, cancer. You're not normal. Say, I'm not normal. Say, I'm anointed. Now say it again. Say, I'm anointed. Say it like you know it. I'm anointed. See? It does something on the inside of you. The Holy Spirit who lives on the inside of you is, is saying, yep, yep, you're agreeing with heaven right now. And when you agree with heaven, guess what? All heavens of power, all heavens ability is available in your life. See, the, here's the thing. Ordinary or normal has limitations. But when you are living according to kingdom principles, you live an unlimited life. Doesn't mean you're not going to have challenges doesn't mean you're not going to have problems but what it does mean is that you're going to overcome every one of them come on now I don't know about you but I don't want to go through hell nobody does but a lot of times we do but see the thing is is if you're going through a storm if you're going through a challenge right now don't stop keep going I was sharing with the team this morning. I was like, you know, here's, here's what I've found in my life, and I've seen it in many other people's lives, and you can probably attest to this. You've either just gone through a storm or in the middle of a storm or getting ready for a storm. A storm is about to come. But see, here's the cool thing is that in those storms, in those seasons of life, it says that we go from faith to faith and from glory to glory. See, if you can do it on your own, then that means you don't need God. And if you don't need God, then obviously you don't need faith. But God says that you need, you, you're, you're required. You're required to live a life of faith because that's the only way you're going to please God. The only way you can pre please God is by faith. And so what that means is my dependence, <coughs> excuse me, my reliance my identity is all wrapped up in him. Amen? And, and, and so what I wanted to talk about a little bit this morning, uh, we're just going to flow with this a little bit. Is it okay to flow? Thank you. Say flow. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> I just want to get to you what God's dropped in my heart because I had tons of notes, tons of material ready, but... 
Yesterday, God interrupted my whole schedule. You guys ever have that happen to you? <laughs> I like that, actually. My, my initial reaction was like, oh, I'm not so sure about it. I don't know. Because I like to have a plan, right? I like to have, how many, how many control freaks do we have in here? Oh, good. You guys are, at least you're honest, because I'm a control freak. I'll just say it right now. I like to be in control. And if you're human, you actually like control. Don't act like you don't, but see, the, whole, the cool thing about God is, is like, hey, I put that in you, but I put that in you so you can control the enemy. The enemy. Keep him at bay because I'm the one that's going to lead you and guide you into my perfect plan for your life. That's what he says. And so uh, I was thinking about what is the title going to be for this because, see, a lot of times we're, we're either in the middle of something or we're coming out of something, like I said earlier, or something's about to happen. And so we're supposed to live, especially since we know that this year is a year, according to God's calendar and what God said for this year, according to the Hebrew culture, 5782, you know, we can look, look that up later or if you want to, is this is a, a year, this is a Rabbi Raskin, he said this, he stated this, that we should be expecting miracles, signs, and wonders in everything we do. This is what God's declaring to us. So, if that's the case, why is it we keep going through ups and downs, highs and lows, dry places, good places, dry places? See, well, here it is. I'm ready. You ready for this? This is the title. If you're going to write this down, there's a miracle in the middle. There's a miracle in the middle. Because, see, the middle kind of stinks, doesn't it? You just got started. You're fired up. Oh, let's do this. We're going to work out. I'm going to get the best shape of my life. You're eating clean or something. And then all of a sudden, it's a birthday party. And your favorite ice cream. <laughs> Preach. <laughs> I'm saying something. <laughs> there, there's, there's your favorite dessert. Or maybe you're, you have a proclivity for Mexican food in your favorite Mexican restaurant or whatever it may be. I don't know. But suddenly that shows up, and then you're like, oh, I missed it. And then you feel like you got to start fresh over again. And if anybody, does anybody have a Bible app on their phone besides me? A couple of you guys, I know you do. You know the streaks? The streaks? Like how many days you've read the Bible? Or the, the, the one on your phone? Let me, let me be clear about that. The one on your phone. So I remember when I first started doing my streaks and stuff, in one year I had like, oh, 297 days straight. That's what I said. I was like, oh, wow, that's amazing. And so then you get in this perfection kind of mode, and then when all of a sudden, I mean, I literally was almost cussed at my Bible app. Because I was not, not really, just, you know, yeah, come on, guys. you thought it before. So this year, I'm like, boom, boom, boom. I've got this, this, I told you guys about the Bible app, Nikki Gumbel, and I'm like, every day, I haven't missed a day. Boom, 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 boom. Well, one day, I got on my app on my iPad instead of my phone. <laughs> Can you see the frustration in my face already? You already know what happened. The next morning, I get up, pick up my phone, start reading it. One streak? What? I mean, we're 60-something days. They already cut or No way. I'm like, it's already ruined. My whole year's over. Why even do it? I can't be perfect now. But that's what we do. We think that our life is supposed to be perfect. And that we should just leap over all these obstacles and they're so easy and in the dry places we just shout unto God with the voice of triumph with your weird opera voice no it doesn't work that way in the middle is where it feels like nothing's happening you've been waiting 15 years believing God that it's going to happen because you know that you've got a word from heaven and there's nothing that can get you off of that. But why? Why hasn't it happened yet? There's dreams inside me. There's visions inside me that God placed in me 
27 years ago. Some of you guys are not even 27 years old in this place. <laughs> I've been believing for something in my life that's been in my heart and I've been speaking it and declaring it longer than some of us have been alive. Does that mean that it's not going to happen and that I'm just being, you know, a positive confession and name it and claim it? No. What it means is that there's moments in your life that God will speak to you about something. And according to Galatians, it says that if you don't get weary, and you don't faint, you will reap. Come on, somebody, in the due season. Everybody say it's my due season. Did you know that there's actually four seasons in a in a year? In each one of those seasons, you can reap something. Did you know that? And so you can be overlapping in seasons. You can be reaping all the time in areas. And there's other areas you know that you're gonna feel like nothing's happening. But I'm going to show you four little steps. I'm not going to put them on the screen or anything because this is coming from here. It's coming straight from here. <coughs> four steps on how you can have the miracle in the middle. Amen? Let's turn to Mark chapter uh, 5. Mark chapter 5. I'm going to put this in my paper Bible. And, and yes, I did open my Bible app this morning to make sure I, I, I had it open so I would get my streak. <laughs> it wasn't for that reason. I actually wanted to read the word. Now, this is going to be the, the Passion Translation that we see up here. And um, yeah, I'm just going to read the whole thing from there. How about that? We'll do that. So, so check this out. I'm going to read it from here, and then I'm going to show you something in the New King James and in the Amplified as well. Because the great thing about the Word is that the Word is alive. And faith is now. You don't live off yesterday's faith. Did anybody uh, eat on Monday? Anybody? One, Chaz ate, that's good. Steve ate, that's good. Darnell, Levon, y'all ate. All the rest of y'all holy people that fasted all week. I know it's going to be good for y'all this this morning when you know we get to eat lunch in a minute. But see, you, you can't live off the memory of what you ate on Monday. I did a fast two years ago, and I did a 10-day water-only fast, and my wife was like, you're never doing that again. Because I was a bear. I was like, I was like, am I fasting because God told me or because I want to prove something? Try to be spiritual. And so, um, food is important. And I remember on day seven how water tastes very bland and how good steak tastes. And, and, and so what was interesting is that on, on day 10, when I got to eat something, really, I couldn't just go eat whatever I wanted because my body wasn't ready for it. My stomach would be cramping and things would be coming out the wrong way and things of that nature. And so, so <laughs> a little too, too detailed. But what I'm trying to tell you is that you can go for a period without the word in your life. And then you can start feeding on the word and it will immediately bring restoration and sustenance to your to your spirit but you never want to go that long without feeding on the word because the word is what gives life to you more than any water fast or anything i know guys have done 40 days water only and that's great that they've done that and i'm and they're they're very amazing people but unless god comes and shows up in my room and, and jesus says hey i want you to just then i'm not doing that because i need to eat you need to be fed, and you need to be fed the Word of God more than you need to be fed any food. Because this is food, and it is life. And so Mark chapter 5 says this. It says, after Jesus returned from across the lake. Now remember, he just returned <coughs> excuse me, from the demoniac. Remember, legion, we are many. This is where he just came back from. 
okay? And so he turned the lake, and a huge crowd of people quickly gathered around him on the shoreline. And just then, a man saw that it was Jesus, and so he pushed through the crowd, and he drew, threw himself down at Jesus' feet. His name was Jairus, a Jewish official who was in charge of the synagogue. And so he pleaded with Jesus, saying over and over, Please come with me. My little daughter is at the point of death, and she's only 12 years old. Come and lay your hands on her. Heal her, and she will live. Immediately, Jesus went with him. And the huge crowd followed, pressing in on him from all sides. Paint that picture right there in your mind. This is like more than the paparazzi. This is more popular than the most popular person right now. There was people just swarmed all around him, just pressing him on all sides, all around him. Can't even see really who's around him other than his 12 disciples and this guy, Jay Harris, right by his side. And it says, now in the crowd... That day, everybody say that day, was a woman who had suffered horribly from a continual bleeding for 12 years. Notice the boy was 12 years old. I mean, the daughter was 12 years old. And then this woman, 12 years suffering. She endured a great deal under the care of various doctors, yet in spite of spending all she had on their treatments, she was not getting better but worse. And when she heard about Jesus healing power, there's something about hearing. How does faith come? Hearing and so you got to hear it more than once, the word of God. Not just hearing a podcast, not just hearing an opinion, but hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so when she heard about Jesus healing power, she pushed through the crowd and came up from behind him and touched his prayer shawl. Now, why is it the saying the prayer shawl? Because they said that in the shawl there was healing in his wings. That's in Isaiah. And it's before she kept saying to herself, if I could only touch his clothes or his garment, in one translation, I know I will be healed. Next verse. And as soon as her hand touched him, her bleeding immediately stopped. One translation says, suddenly, and she knew it, for she could feel her body instantly being healed of her disease. Jesus knew at once that someone had touched him, for he said with power that always surged around him had passed out uh, through him for someone to be healed. And he turned and he spoke to the crowd, who touched my clothes? His disciples answered, what do you mean who touched you? Look at this huge crowd. They're all pressing up against us. Or you, but Jesus' eyes swept across the crowd looking for the one who had touched him for healing. When the woman who experienced this miracle realized what had happened to her, she came before him, trembling with fear, and she threw herself down at his feet, saying, I was the one who touched you. And she told him her story of what had just happened. And then Jesus said to her, Daughter, because you dared to believe. How many people in here dare to believe? Come on now. Dare to believe in impossible situations. Because you dare to believe, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Now, peace isn't the old Catholic peace or the shalom. Peace means when he said that, he was literally saying, go healed with nothing, nothing missing, nothing lacking, and nothing broken in your body. So go with peace in your heart and be free from your suffering. That's pretty awesome, right? And before he had finished speaking, people arrived from Jairus' house and pushed through the crowd as well. So you, she pushed through one way, they pushed through another way. And she gets this restoration, this healing, Jesus speaks to her, and at that very same moment, boom, these people show up and they go, hey, don't trouble the master any longer. Your daughter has died. Like, what? Like, what do you mean? But Jesus refused to listen to what they told and told Jairus, the Jewish official, don't yield to fear. All you need to do is keep on believing. Amen? 
Father, bless the reading of your word this morning. We thank you for eyes to see in a way we've never seen. We thank you for ears to hear your voice in a stranger's voice we don't follow. We thank you for deposits, those seeds being deposited in our hearts of good soil. Good soil bearing much fruit in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Now, you read the story, and we've heard it multiple times, but a lot of times we read this story, and we don't really see how the two are connected. How is it this woman just suddenly breaks up the whole scene, and she gets her miracle, but Jairus is in the middle of despair. Like, all hope is now lost. Like, what happens in the middle? What do we do in the middle where things feel like it's dead there's no hope for my future there's no hope for a better job my marriage is on the rocks I'm never going to get what I've been believing for well in these moments there's so many nuggets in this scripture right here and there's things that she did that we're going to unpack a little bit today so we can be walking in the miraculous in the middle of the doldrums of life. Amen? Amen. So, <clears throat> excuse me. If you were to look at this, this woman, she was obviously a person of wealth. Because it said that she spent all, it took her 12 years to spend all that she had, right? Right? So, so she had some money, she had some influence, and so what she really did was she was holding on to medical science and holding on to what the doctors could do for her, correct? And that's what we do so many times. Our first response is, well, let's go to the doctor. I have friends that, you know, like, their kids start sniffling, they're like, run to the ER. And really what that is is fear. And Jesus even said specifically to Jairus, who's daughter was now officially dead hey don't allow fear in only believe now here's something that the woman with the issue of blood and she's in all three of the four accounts she's the only one that she's not in is, is John she's in Matthew she's in Mark and she's in Luke this historical account of what happened in her life now what happened in here is very specific and here's what happens the very first thing that happened in her was she heard you've got to hear the word of God in order to receive faith right so she heard something what what are you hearing the majority of your day See, the, the, the thing about her, too, in this, and I, the reason why I wore a coat today, one reason is because I like it. <laughs> but thank you, thank you. But another reason is this. She had to wear a shawl that identified her condition. How many times do we identify with our condition? Well, this is what happened, and this is what the insurance company is saying, this is what the doctor says, this is what my boss says, this is what they're saying about my child, and, and we get all these kinds of labels. My wife, you know, she's teaching again, uh, and then they say, well, this child is A, B, C, D, E, H, G, and they got A, D, 7, D, all these stupid letters, and she's like, no, they just are, uh, need a little structure, or they need some love. See, the world wants to condition you and label you but what I love about this woman with the issue of blood is she did not allow her condition to change her position when you hear the word of God it should change your position as a matter of fact when she was she had to run around for all this time if she went out in public which she wasn't supposed to do if you had an issue of blood for the ladies out there, you were not even supposed to go outside. And then if she did, she had to cry out or call out, unclean. She had to identify, she had to call out what the world was saying about her. But she heard the word, and the word supersedes whatever the world says. 
Amen? The world may say that there's no hope. The world may say there's no healing for you. And this, but the word of God says that by his stripes, you are healed. And for the spirit of heaviness, what does he give you? Joy, peace, strength, right? So she had to change some things about how she thought. Because we know that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? But see, at first, you have to hear first. And once you hear something, what happens then? Then you have to think. What are, what are you thinking? What thoughts are you thinking? You know, we know, we've known this for quite some time, all you, you know, scholars and scientists out there, you know. Psychology Today says that you, you think, an average person thinks fifty to 80,000 thoughts per day. What am I going to wear? What am I going to do? Should I open this bottle? Should I not open this bottle? You know, you're, there's all these thoughts. And it says that of those thoughts that you think per day, 80% of them are negative. 80% are negative. However, if you start reading the Word of God and getting the Word of God so on the inside of you, it changes the way you think. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says that very clearly. It says to be what? Transformed. Be transformed by what? The renewing of your mind. See, you can think new thoughts. You can think positive thoughts. You can think godly thoughts. And literally, you can think the way he thinks. Now, I know it says in Isaiah, it says, oh, my thoughts aren't your thoughts and my ways aren't your ways. But Corinthians says, but God. Thank God for but God. But God has revealed them to us. So if we're going to walk in faith and we're going to have this miracle in the middle, we have to trust the word of God. Amen? So the first thing you have to do is hear the word and trust the word. You can hear it, but if you don't trust it, it's not going to change you. Okay? You know, I mean, the scripture, we already said it, but it's Romans 10, 17 if you're taking notes. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You have to hear and continue to hear and continue to hear. Because one of the things that, this, that it says here is that woman, she kept saying to herself, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I shall, not I might, I shall be healed. So what was she doing? She heard something and she thought on it. She meditated. The word meditate in Hebrew means to mutter. That means she continued to, to continue to speak to herself. Now, the New Living Translation of this account, it says that she thought to herself. That she continually thought and thought. Now, I love what the Amplified says. The Amplified says that she continually said. See, there's things in your life that aren't going to change until you start talking to it. So you got to talk to it. See, the thing about these thoughts is you can have thoughts but the thoughts can't have you. The thoughts, a lot of times, does anybody, this is how I used to be when I was, you know, 20 something years ago. I would have, I would, you know, just got on fire for God and things were just rocking in my life and I was, thank you, God, and this and that. And then there are certain areas in my life that are weak spots. Does anybody have any weak spots? We all do. Like, if you ever go to the gym, has anybody been to a gym before? You know, Okay, you, you, it, there's guys in the gym that I call flamingo kids. And if you, have you guys seen a flamingo before? You know, big upper and then tiny stick legs. So they got this huge upper body and their legs look like toothpicks. And like they're, their upper body is suing their lower body for no support. You know, that kind of thing. Um, and why is that? Because it's hard work. Nobody likes conditioning. Nobody likes training the hard places. Nobody likes doing this. So, so, and so what I did, those weak areas in my life, I would beat myself up if I would start to think or a thought would come in. Like, oh, I shouldn't have thought about that. Oh, oh my gosh, I'm such a terrible person. God, please forgive me. Oh, I did it again. God, I'm sorry. Oh, oh, oh. Have you ever looked at, hey, don't look at the screen right now. Nobody look at the screen. We're, oh, I did it. 
We do that so often. But you need to realize something. The thoughts you can't stop from coming in, but you can keep them from making a nest. So the thoughts, they're going to fly over. You can't stop a bird from flying over your head, but you can stop them from building a nest. So you can't worry about the thoughts. Thoughts can't have you. Amen? So she started to think about the word. She started to think about, hey, Jesus is healed. He just, he just 2,000, you know, 2,000 pigs or however many it was just ran off a cliff at the word that Jesus said, come out. The guy was worshiping, so I'm going to go and I'm going to worship. I'm going I'm to touch his prayer shawl. She thought and thought and thought and thought and thought. And literally what that thought did, it started to rewire. According to neuroscientists, you can rewire your brain by choosing to think consistently on something. Literally in, in neuroscience, it's called superposition. Everybody say superposition. Okay, the rest of you guys say it. Superposition. <laughs> Superposition is this. Is it, we've watched surf shows. We've watched Point Break. We've seen these things. We've, you know, I've seen people surfing out on the beach before. And here's what superposition is to make you understand it a little bit easier. Superposition is like, say, a surfer is catching a wave, and he's paddling, and he hops up on the board. Boom. At that precise moment, you can either curl Right, or you can turn left, front side or back side. That's it, is surfing or snowboarding, whichever. Superposition, you have three seconds, according to neuroscientists, to change your thought. Three seconds in superposition. So you can literally choose to go this way, and then as you, if you think the good thoughts, if you think the godly thoughts, then literally you start to fire, your neurons fire it positively, and it releases endorphins in your uh, body, and it blocks cortisol, and makes you actually feel better and less stress. But if you think negatively, literally it, it, it short-circuits your brain and your body releases cortisol and stress. And it's the same equivalent in your body as a broken bone. Superposition. So you have, literally, every time that thought comes in at you, or the devil tries to tell you, hey, what are you going to do about that? Hey, what are you going to do? You've got three seconds. Smack it down. Thank you. You guys are good. You guys said it. Smack it down. You got one Mississippi. You know the the WWE world, two that fake wrestling stuff. One Mississippi, two Mississippi. That's if you're from the South. Three Mississippi. You got a choice to choose which way you're gonna go. What are we gonna do? Smack it down. Take every thought captive. See, it's not how I thought. It's how the Word of God says. Amen? Amen. Because here's the, here's the issue. A lot of times, what I've heard over the past, you know, almost seven years as a pastor, is I don't really feel like doing that anymore. Anybody there? Right? Feelings follow thoughts. See, if you don't feel a certain way, it's because you've been thinking a certain way. So feelings follow thoughts. And so if you want your feelings to change, well, I just don't feel like I'm in love with them anymore. Well, that's because you've been thinking negative thoughts about that. Just being real on our Valentine's Day weekend. <laughs> Start thinking good things. Amen? And once you think, it says that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. She began to continue to speak some things. If I touch the hem of his garment. When I touch the hem of his garment. See, she, she adjusted. There's an adjusting process. You're not going to get it perfect every time, but as long as you continue to, to work and, and to speak, you're going to walk into the very things that you're speaking about your life. Did you know that where you're right now in your life is because of what you've been saying over the past couple of years? Man, I'm just always so stressed. Oh, really? Why do you think that is? I don't know. It's just always something. Well, that's because you're saying it's always something. 
And if, it, it, you know, I, I have, my wife has caught me on this a few times. How many of the is what it is people have, you know, is what it is. That's never been good, ever. It's never had a positive outcome. It, it, it should never be it is what it is. You know, it should be my God causes me to triumph every time. But you're never going to walk into the promise and, until you start to say what God says about your situation. Now, the, the thing that I want to get to, and, and we're going to wrap it up in just a second. Both the woman with the issue of blood and Jairus, they were two separate people. But they had one common thing together. They were desperate. How many of you have been desperate? You know what? I, I know that I've had highs and lows, but when you get desperate for God, you're like, I'm not going to leave this place without experiencing his presence, without leaving that junk at the altar. Or I'm going to do whatever I've got to do to get where I need to get, to get that answer, to get that healing, to get that deliverance. you got to be desperate. But see, whenever you get into that place of desperation, that's a great place to be. But the enemy comes at you and he starts telling you this, why bother? I had that thought this week. Hey, why bother? You already know what they're going to say. You already know what the, the situation's going to be and why even try? That's exactly the wrong thing to do. The enemy's going to hit you with why bother? And you've got to respond with what the word says. Amen? Amen? I wrote some things down for you to hear here. Hear, hear. Here's the questions that the devil will usually hit you with this on this Valentine's weekend. Why bother with being pure when everyone else is sleeping around? Why bother not drinking what all my friends do? I mean, it's just a couple of gummies. It's legal. Why bother trying to get out of debt? I'm never going to get out. I'll just get another credit card. Not a wise choice. Why bother believing God for an impossible situation when it hasn't come through yet? See, the devil will try to attack you in the little things to keep you from receiving the big. Yes, yeah, the small foxes that ruin the vine. So there's the three D's of why bother and the first one is discouragement. It's too late. I've done too much. I've messed up too many times. I keep repeating the same cycles. Another one would be depression. That's very rampant in today's culture and society. And depression will make you just want to give up. But thank God the word says that for the spirit of heaviness, that's depression, that's oppression, it says that he gives us joy. Amen? Amen. Beauty for ashes. And the third thing that is one of the strongest things that I've seen ever is distraction. Did you know the devil doesn't care about your finances? He ain't trying to steal your money. There's billionaires out there that are living some pretty nasty lifestyles. He's not after that. What he's after is your joy. What he's after is your peace. What he's after is your strength. And the only thing he's got to do is get you distracted. Anybody seen Up? You've got kids, you've seen Up. And you'll know what I'm going to say. Squirrel! <laughs> right? Hey, hey, I, I love you. I'll be your master. <laughs> Squirrel! That's what the devil wants to do is he wants to get you distracted. 
he'll throw a squirrel over here and he'll, he'll throw this problem over here or he'll, he'll put some pressure in your marriage over there or he'll, he'll send you a bill that you weren't expecting to get you distracted say I'm not getting distracted see I believe that everyone you're here in person because you're desperate for the things of God that you're hungry for more of him I'd rather have 10 hungry people in this room than 10,000 people here just to see what happens. She was hungry. Jairus was hungry. See, Jairus, he was a man of, uh, he was like a dignitary. He was a man of affluence and influence. But what did he do? He came and threw himself at Jesus' feet. He was desperate. He was hungry. I need you, Jesus. The woman with the issue of blood, she had to throw off her identity. She had to throw off what the world was calling her. She was hungry. She was desperate for more of him. We need to get more desperate, more hungry for more of him. Amen? Now, I am going to close with this. I knew it wasn't going to be a shout and down message. I just wanted to share this with you, though. First thing she did was heard second thing she did was think third thing she did was speak but the fourth thing she did was act it's real easy for us to hear this oh yeah yeah I know that yeah 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 but how often do we get the first three but we don't do the fourth remember last week the Lord was showing us that, that the moment that he took his shoes off is when it became holy ground when Moses took his shoes off, it became holy ground. And as a matter of fact, I was reading, I continued on and reading into Exodus chapter 4. And in Exodus chapter 4, it was saying something very significant because Moses, God was telling him to do something in his private time before he went to Pharaoh. And he goes, hey, I want you, to, excuse me, I want you to do this. I want you to, he goes, okay, well, if I do that, then who am I going to say sent me? And he goes, the I am of the I am. I am all that there is. That means whatever the need be, I am more than enough to meet and fulfill that need. But Moses, when he's out there, he had something in his hand. And it took faith for him to obey what God said. And here's what he did. Moses, uh, he's calling out to God, and God says, what do you have in your hand? And so many times we don't think we have enough or we can do anything, but I believe that God's asking us, what's in our hand? What do you have in your hand? What is it that you can do where you are right now? And he goes, well, I've got a staff. And he goes, throw the staff down. And when he threw the staff down, when he let go of what he was carrying, the miracle happened because that staff turned into a snake. See, you can't have greater faith and great control at the same time. You have to let go of one of them. You're either going to have a lot of control or a lot of faith. It's one or the other. And so he, once he let go of the control, to see what a staff was, the staff represented protection, stability in the rocky places. It kept him from falling down. It was also protecting against, you know, animals and beasts. And, but it was also a marker a reminder he would mark on that staff the things that God had done remember he's you know oh yeah you did this and you did that and remember last week we also heard that Moses was insecure stuttered and a murderer but God didn't call him murderer he didn't call him Mr. Insecure he didn't s s say you're a stutterer he said Moses Moses so I just want to remind you once again that the devil knows your name, but he'll only call you by your sin. God knows your sin, but he'll only call you by your name. And, and, and so he calls out to Moses, and he tells Moses something significant after throwing down the staff, letting go of the control. Then he says, pick it back up. Now, has anybody ever grabbed a snake before besides me? You don't grab a snake by a tail. I mean, it may be a garter snake, but even then it's going to turn and bite you. You usually grab it up at the head and squeeze hard. He grabbed it at the tail, 
And when he grabbed it at the till, that's when it became a miracle and turned back into a rod. And what I thought was so interesting about that is that he did it first in the wilderness before he went before Pharaoh. See, God's got things set up for you in your private time with him. The time where you're hearing the word of God, you're thinking on the word of God, and you're speaking the word of God, declaring the end from the beginning, and then you're acting on the word. Maybe God's telling you to, to surrender something in your life, or maybe God's telling you to get plugged in uh, for something for your life. Whatever it is, you need to act. You need to step out. You need to let go, and you need to pick things up. Amen? Amen. And see, when you do, that's when you're going to see the miracle in the middle. J. Iris, he was in the middle of despair. His daughter's dead. Twelve years living healthy and whole. And this other lady, twelve years of nasty stuff and, and shame and, and rejection and all these things and they both met in the middle one received their healing the other one received a bad report but what did Jesus tell them don't yield to fear only believe and it's almost like in my mind my theater mind the woman the issue of blood goes here's what you do you just continue to think on what Jesus told you, and then you continue to speak. When Jesus gets there, my daughter's going to live. When Jesus gets there, my daughter's going to live. When Jesus gets there, my daughter's going to live. Do you see that? See, the thing is, the enemy wants you to take hold of those negative thoughts so those negative thoughts will take hold of you. But God's saying, no, I've called you to think like I think. And the one thing that he wants you to think of is from victory. Not for victory, from victory. Amen? Amen. See, the thing about this, and this is the very last scripture right now. It's in Mark 6, 56. Thank you. Mark 6, 56. This woman's faith. And the reason why I said that about Jairus and her say it, talking to him, that's my you know, uh, own interpretation of it. But look at this. Mark 6, 56. Same story. Whenever Jesus entered into villages, cities, or the country, they laid the sick people of the marketplaces all up and down the sides of the street. And they begged him that they might just touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched him were what? Made well. Where do you think they got that from? back up into the previous chapter the woman with the issue of blood if I can just touch the hem of his garment see her faith was contagious I believe that when we start to step out and start to act on the things that God put in our hearts and we actually meditate on it and start to speak it over and start to let it ruminate on the inside of us that when we step out that our faith should be so contagious that there's something different about us that when you walk into your place of business, man, what is it about you? I notice you're happy and everybody else is not. You'll walk up into Walmart and people are like, hey, man, uh, and they'll start telling you their whole life story. You know why? Because you've got some contagious faith that they need. Amen? That's right. You're anointed. See, here's how you can do all of this. Here's how you can have contagious faith. Here's how you can have the miracle in the middle. You've got to do this. You've got to declare the promise in the middle of the problem. I'm telling you something that you're going to need this week, okay? It may not be a shouting down message right now for you, but you need to be declaring the promise of God in the middle of the problem. Whatever it is that, that you're going through or you may be coming up against, declare God's promise in the middle of the problem. Amen? You know, it's Super Bowl Sunday right now. Is anybody going to watch the Super Bowl tonight besides me? Okay. Two whole people. We have no sports people here except for maybe two of us. No, I'm just kidding. Just the teams. You know, the Bengals, I mean, LSU, Joe Burrows, you know, amazing quarterback. We're going to win. Um, so anyhow... 
there's something about other than in this room. <laughs> people that are Bengals fans and people that are Rams fans, they have an expectation about today. They're going out right now, and they might be buying cases and cases of beer, or they might be getting, you know, their chips and dip and preparing this big get-together for this big old party because they're expecting to see somebody win. And then what did they say? We did it! You didn't practice? I don't see you out there running. I don't see you getting that paycheck either. <laughs> that would be nice. But what is it about that? We like, to, uh, we like to identify with victory. Why? There's an expectation that our team is going to win. And now, here's the thing about those teams. When they're out there playing today and they have their, their um, halftime, they're not going to go in there and, hey, guys, let's self-reflect real quick. Let's just go over and, and reflect over the things that we've done and let's just give ourselves a good pat on the back. No, they're not going to do that at all. They're going to say, okay, guys, hey, look, this is the second half. Guess what? New fresh start. We're going to come out there. Hey, you're going to step up this game. Hey, they're getting you over this area. We're going to come, and we're going to win this thing. Ready, break. Our Bengals on three. One, two, three. Bengals. There's an expectation. Because you know what? It's not over. It's still the second half of the game. And no matter what you've been going through, no matter what challenges you face, it's never too late. It's not even close to being over. Because the moment that you say yes, God says, I do too. Amen? So when you come to the end of yourself, that's when the miraculous begins. When you're in the middle, that's the perfect moment for the miraculous in your life. Amen. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you so much for your word. It's your word that does the work. It's your word that has the power. It's your word that brings the change. And Father, we thank you for your word that transforms us, that invigorates us, and that changes us from glory to glory and faith to faith. And so, Father, this word that we've heard today, we cover it, we protect it, we water it, so it will bear much fruit in our lives. In Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Well, praise God. We're going to go ahead and receive our offering this morning before we, we head out. But before we do that, I want to, if you need an envelope for your giving, if you can really just raise your hand, our ushers would love to serve you. And there, if you want to give by text, you can give by text. By text the word give to 918 302 2488.